I think we better get on with it instead of trying to do individual well, readings like here. Okay. 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 Look at all of these hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I, should I begin? Fine. All right. We were very appreciative, as always, of this opportunity to be with you, and we know, it, we know it's a very <laughs> we know it's a very tight day, so we're going to uh, dispense with any formalities and get right with it. We have here a representation of Hearst Washington personnel and a representation of our editors from around the country. Uh, unfortunately, time and room would not accommodate all, but uh, we, we appreciate the group that is here. Uh, as a first question, Mr. President, I know that uh, you are very carefully avoiding talking about uh, a very major uh, victory, despite the fact that I'm sure you're confident of one, but my question has to do with assuming that election and assuming it to, to be of significant proportions, what is your number one priority for a new administration? Well, it has a few parts to it. Um, if there is a new administration, I mean mine, That's for what me, I meant too. <laughs> uh, if there is, uh, I want to continue with what we called a new beginning back when we started this last four years, the economic recovery that we've had, and I want to continue on the road that we started in the international scene, which is aimed at peace, and, and that is the dual track. Uh, everyone seems to have overlooked in this campaign the fact that when we set out to rebuild our defenses, we said there was a second track of equal importance, and that was to engage the Soviet Union in legitimate talks to reduce weapons, particularly the strategic weapons. And uh, while they've walked away from the table, uh, at this time, I can't believe they're going to stay away. I think it's in their own uh, interest uh, to join us at that table again. But the, the program that we started, which was based on the tax cuts to provide an incentive to get the economy growing again, the reducing of, uh, first, the increase in federal spending, which was at a rate of about 17 percent and is down around 6 percent now uh, to continue getting that down, and we have uh, almost uh, 2,500 recommendations by the Grace Commission that we have a task force working on. We've implemented some already that we've been able to do administratively. Others would require legislation, but to uh, put those in place, and I, uh, you know, I have a memory of we did that in California with the state. And when the state was in a situation akin to what the present uh, government of the United States has been, and we found that the advice and the, uh, that we got and the uh, program that was put forward by all those volunteers, leaders, business leaders throughout the state, well, the same thing has happened here, only we've had ten times as many at the federal level, which is fitting because California is only about one-tenth the population of the nation. Um, recommendations that are simply based on putting uh, modern business practices to work for government. Yeah. And, um, and they worked. So this is what we, we want to do. Good. Thank you. Bill? Mr. President, we want to save your time here. When you came into office, let's say you had ten problems, I would say that you certainly got on the way to solve them, if not solve at least half of them, employment and lower, lower uh, taxes and, and, and uh, well, you know, what they are, the things that you've done well. On the scale of one to five of the remaining things, where would you put the deficit? They put a lot of stress on it. You hear some people stressing. 
What, what do you think? Then? I think the deficit is important. I couldn't say it was unimportant because no. for 30 years out on the mashed potato circuit, and long before I ever thought I'd be in public life, I've been complaining about the deficit. <laughs> but for 50 years, the the group and the philosophy that has dominated our government for most of that time uh, has continued to tell us it doesn't mean anything and that, uh, well, my opponent right now in the campaign, if you look at his past, uh, he upheld the deficits when he was a part of government. He said they stimulated the economy. They worked against having too much unemployment. He even advocated once doubling the deficit. Now, I don't feel that way. But I also am not going to panic in believing that the no. deficit right now, when you see the growth of the economy, when you see the way unemployment has gone down, even while the deficits are going up, they talk about interest rates. Well, interest rates were coming down at their steepest drop at the same time that the deficit was going up. But I believe that you get at that deficit by bringing government, as I say, back into government's proper functions and running it in an efficient manner so that it isn't running away out there beyond your revenues, and at the same time practicing things like the tax policies that have brought about the growth. Now, the deficit this year is down about $20 billion less than it was uh, last year. And we look at that and how did it happen, and it has come about uh, partly some because we never did get all we wanted in cuts, but mainly in the growth of the economy. The improved re receipts, even with the cut in the tax rate, revenue. the amount of revenues are up. Yeah. And uh, we just, we have to continue on that path and do more of it so it comes down faster than $20 billion a year. Right. Well, um, you have resisted uh, repealing the uh, indexing and the third year of the tax cut. Would you consider those as uh, possible remedies if the deficit didn't come down as fast as you would like? I would have to say, it, and of course, <laughs> you know, I, I always get in trouble with this because when I, no matter how I try to hedge it and say I'm talking about if, uh, a real hypothetical if and a thing that I don't believe is going to happen, it would have to be the last resort entirely. But I don't see anything where where tax rates, increasing tax rates, and the threat they are to economic growth, where that can be looked at as a legitimate solution. In the five years before we came here, tax taxes doubled in this country, and we had $318 billion worth of deficits. And uh, so I, I think that the I think that there were two things about the sudden increase in the level of deficits. Part was structural, that's been built in over these 50 years in the government where the Congress could sit there and didn't have to increase the amount. It was already in law that it would increase. The second half of it was, was the cyclical, the recession that we went into. Well, that had started in 1979. And when you hit bottom in that, you've got unemployed to take care of, and that increases government expenses, and you've lost the revenues that government was once getting from those people when they were employed. Inflation was going up. Inflation, yes. Okay. Yes, Mr. Mr. President, you have a vision of the future in which the American people could be defended against offensive nuclear weapons. Critics contend that if we develop an anti-missile system, the Soviets will strive to catch up and there'll be another costly arms race. To avoid that, to relieve the concern of our allies that the superpowers may control the skies, would you be willing to consider having all of the uh, existing uh, nuclear weapons powers, uh, that is our allies, China and Russia, participate with us in joint research and development of a defense system that to, could conceivably save mankind from a nuclear holocaust? Well, I haven't suggested such a thing as that, but I know that it was my decision here and around this table with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The nuclear missile is the only weapon in the history of man that has never automatically created a defensive weapon against it. and. I said, certainly there must be a better answer 
than a deterrent, which is all we have now. Granted, it's worked for 40 years, in which we say, if you do it to us, uh, the, yeah. we'll our strike against you will be more than you can afford. Yeah. But it seems to me much more practical if you could find something that kills weapons instead of kills people, kills people. In other words, we're sitting here, if you really analyze it, we're saying that someday, if the Soviets attacked, and we always say that because I don't think there's anyone in America or there's ever been an administration in this country that has ever contemplated that we would make war, start a war, make war on them. We look, and I told this to Mr. Gromyko, that we look at them as the threat to us, and we think in terms of, of deterrence. But that deterrence is based on that someone would sit here where I'm now sitting and have to give the order that slaughtered millions of people on the other side. Uh, if they did, that's the only defense. So uh, we were all in agreement that it was worth us starting out to find, if we could have, uh, could, could find a weapon that could intercept those, those missiles and intercept them thoroughly enough, not just like having anti-aircraft guns uh, some of the bombers always get through. Uh, no, to really stop them. And this was why on the debate the other night, I said, I could see, whether it's me here or someone else, I could see if we were successful and came up with all of our technology, and there's no one in the world can match it, with such a weapon, then I could see saying to the Soviet Union, telling them, and saying, now will you sit down with us and do the practical yeah. thing, which is get rid of those weapons, because we can prove to you that they won't work anymore. We've got a department of defense without a defense. We've got a department of defense without a defense. Yes. Mr. President, the Kissinger Commission, as you know, on Central America said there were two basic underpinnings of the permanent state of unrest in that part of the world and that, that the communists are sure to exploit. And one of these was the high population growth rate, which it said uh, tri a triple population in, in something like 30 years. And the other one was the decline in commodity prices and the, the continuing instability of commodity prices. Beyond trying to uh, put into place such market, free market uh, elements as can be put into place in the region to address those questions, what specifically would your administration in the next four years do to address both problems, namely the high growth of population in Central America and the instability in commodity prices? Well, now we're talking Central America. Yes. yes. Well, here again, I believe that the, that bipartisan Kissinger Commission gave us a very workable program. Three-fourths of that program was aimed at the social reforms and the economic reforms that are needed uh, in so many parts of, of Latin America, particularly now, in this instance, in Central America. And one-fourth to help them with their security so that, uh, such as El Salvador, while they're, where they're trying as desperately as they are to have a democracy and to uh, have an improved living for their people, you've got to protect them from the guerrilla forces or, or provide them with the means of protecting themselves is what we're doing uh, while they institute these reforms. But it's akin to our Caribbean initiative. What we have to do is not just go there with aid, which has been too much of our practice in the past. What we have to do is restore their economies or restore, I don't think they've ever had good ones, give them a basic economy in which they can become self-sustaining and where they can, by their own efforts, begin to improve the quality of living for their people. Yes, the poverty down there is what makes them uh, subject to subversion from outside, the kind that Cuba exports and the Soviet Union. And most of their revolutions in the past have simply exchanged one set of rulers for another set of rulers. So we're very serious about that plan, and we want to proceed with it, but it will be aimed at uh, helping them. In the Caribbean plan, uh, it grew out of one, a thing that we just started kind of, you might say, ad hoc, uh, 
uh, with the Caribbean, and that was, uh, I called some people in New York, and uh, who've always been willing to participate in public affairs and uh, people of means and industry and so forth, about uh, looking at the Caribbean for investment, to meet some of their problems by uh, private investment in those areas. And uh, uh, they did a great deal of this. And from that, we then came forth with the Caribbean Initiative Plan. Now, this other is similar to that, but for Central America. And we want it implemented. We want to go forward. The difficulty that's holding you back is the, uh, the violence that's going on. But I think this is the answer. They've got to, and then, well, the other adjunct to that, the, the birth rate, we've been helping all over the world with information and family planning and so forth, trying to uh, help other countries where, where they have this problem, which, once again, they can do it themselves. Mr. President, I have a question about your age. We've heard, we've heard rumors about, about the various problems that you have based on your age. We heard some very clever one-liners during the debate that I thought were, were, were some of the high points of the debate, as a matter of fact. But without resorting to one-liners, do you see age as an issue? Do you think age should be an issue? And are you willing at any point in the next, next four years to undergo any kind of competency testing or anything like that? How do you, how do, how do you feel on that, that, that issue of age? Well, <laughs> uh, <Not> one -liners. <laughs> no, no one-liners. Um, let's put it this way. I think an issue of health is important, and I have been ready and will continue to be ready any time to hand over any medical records. Uh, having had a father-in-law who was a noted surgeon and the president of the American College of Surgeons, Loyal Davis, um, he was the one that uh, started Nancy and myself on annual uh, physical checkups. And uh, we're going to continue those and make them available. Uh, I'd be the first one if my health were a factor that, that I couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't fulfill the requirements. But some of the things that have been bruited about are just not true. Uh, I haven't had any more tendency to drop off to sleep in a dull <laughs> meeting since I've been in this job than I used to have sometimes when I was in college listening to a dull lecture. <laughs> uh, and uh, I guess I, well, I know I'm, I've been very blessed and very fortunate. Physiologically, uh, all the doctors that examine me, even the strangers, uh, tell me that physiologically I'm a lot younger than my years. Now, if that ever changes, uh, then that would be, as I say, a matter of health. Yeah, and it is a matter of health. and uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to uh, be sitting in a rocking chair while things were going on around me that I couldn't <laughs> participate in. Mr. President, I'd like to pick up on, on Harry's question for a minute and get back to Central America. Even your harshest critics uh, at this date going into the election are conceding that your policy in Central America is working. Uh, Mr. Duarte has turned out to be a courageous leader for pluralism. Uh, even in Nicaragua, where Comandante Ortega will undoubtedly be reelected, there is a resurgence of interest on the part of the people that is notable through the efforts of Arturo Cruz and others toward pluralism. And the atmosphere seems to be shifting dramatically uh, in large due to your efforts. Would you envision, or do you envision, circumstances, therefore, in your second term, where it might be possible uh, that you might open negotiations and seek for a renewal of friendship with Cuba? Might Cuba be, to you, what China was to Richard Nixon? I have to tell you that early in my administration, we thought that we were hearing some signals from there that that was wanted. And we did make a move. And nothing came of it. I recall that. Yeah, the they, they weren't are ready. Now, if circumstances change, uh, yes. It, it would take them or him, uh, if he is still in charge, uh, it would take him being willing to divorce. <laughs> his marriage partner, the Soviet Union. And uh, I have I've long dreamed of 
What would we like to indicate to him that rejoining the family of the Americas uh, could probably offer him far more and his people far more than, uh, than he's getting in this partnership with the Soviet Union. Now, we will close the door to that, just as in, the, in Central America now with Nicaragua. We've, we've had a man uh, meeting and uh, meeting the Nicaraguan government representatives and, and talking what is needed. We're not, this whole thing, let's make it plain that, and this involves the Contras too, it isn't overthrow of a government. It is getting that revolutionary government to return to the principles of revolution that it enunciated when it was fighting the revolution, which was democracy, human rights, free press, free labor unions, and so forth. Now the election isn't going to mean anything because, as we all know, he's made it impossible, even if somebody in one of those splinter parties lets his name go on the ballot. We know that it is not a legitimate election. It reminds me of the little joke about the, the Kremlin. That there was a break-in in the Kremlin one night, and someone stole next year's election results. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're seeing down there. But yes, I, I don't know whether, when they're that indoctrinated, and uh, they, don't, they don't change or give up very easily, I think that the, what we're seeing is a government very similar to that of the Soviet Union where they're not about to make any changes that are going to uh, eliminate their hold on all the power. But you have to keep trying. And one thing out of this election, the very fact that men like Cruz will not run, I think has brought out into the open how much dissatisfaction there is among the people of Nicaragua with the present regime. But yes, if there's, uh, we'll keep watching for any hints or signs from Castro's Cuba, because that's, that's one of the great tragedies of all time. Mr. President, uh, the last uh, couple of days, Mr. Mondale has been advocating uh, in that something he would do would quickly move towards direct uh, sea and airlift for to relieve the starvation situation in Northern Africa. Uh, do you see any opportunity whereby the U.S. will be able to, despite the, the, the Marcus, uh, Marxist regime there, that we can do something about uh, aiding more directly in that situation? We have been the biggest single contributor to Ethiopia. $19 billion last year, but we've upped that to $45 billion this year. Uh, we've, total for Africa is about $173 billion. The problem, I don't think it has to do with the, that they're Marxists so much as just the inability of their bureaucracy to function. Much of the food that we've sent, they're still sitting on the docks. And we are working all the time and holding meetings, our people, with theirs on trying to get them to assign more vehicles for transportation of this food and to get it moving better. We've done some of our help through some of the groups uh, like Catholic uh, Aid, uh, that do seem to be able to get to certain areas uh, with this help. I talked on the phone the other day to uh, Mother Teresa. She has four locations where her, uh, her nuns are there in uh, Ethiopia and talks of the people that are coming there and they just can't get the, the food. And uh, I have called our aid uh, group here and put them in touch with her about uh, the location of those and where uh, how we can do this, but we're working every minute trying to break this log jam. We've, we've provided gasoline for their planes. We've done things of that kind. Uh, so that is what has to be broken, is just they don't have the infrastructure, they don't, they're not distributing what they're getting. Mr. President, would you assess the impact of Geraldine Ferraro first in this election and secondly, on the future of politics. Well, now, <laughs> I, first of all, the, from the standpoint of Owen being the candidate, high time, fine. Uh, I wonder, though, if it can't be called a great uh, breaking point because if you look at, uh, well, in our own administration here, the positions, the gains that have been made uh, in our country, 
we've, I think it was inevitable that we're going to see and see a presidential candidate. I think the, the problem was here that uh, in the selection it was uh, someone who had not uh, gone out and, well, for example, suppose there had been a woman candidate for the presidency in their primaries and contesting, and then would be a logical choice having presented herself before the whole electorate for the nominee as the presidency to say that's who I want to be my running mate. This kind of was reaching uh, out and it, I think it looked to too many people as if they were simply reaching just for that reason. Mm -hmm. The other way it would be say here's a woman that come up, came up to the place where she's accepted in the eyes of the people as uh, being under consideration for the top spot and sure she's a logical choice and uh, I wish it had been that way but we've uh, you can't you can't look at a Margaret Thatcher and and a Golda Meir and uh, for that matter an Indira Gandhi and say why should we be so different but we've made such gains I think part of them the Supreme Court now I think the cabinet members that we have here I think the I think right now uh, there are an awful lot of people in this country that would be uh, ready to mark the ballot if Jean Kirkpatrick uh, ran for anything. Uh, she, is, uh, she has become so respected and so popular mm -hmm. throughout the country. But you don't think that Geraldine Ferraro has had hit quite that hard? I don't think it hit quite that hard because of the factors that I just mentioned here. First of all, it wasn't that big uh, a move. It was a, it, it, to, a, to an extent, it was a logical move thing that is going to happen and uh, whether this was the, the time or not. I guess what I'm saying is that that movement must be based not just purely on the sex of the candidate, but must be based also on the qualifications of the candidate. Uh, we've had a long tradition in this country of diplomats now getting involved in politics. And yet more than 20 ambassadors appointed by you, including personal friends, have come out for Senator Helms, not for Senator Percy or not for other Republicans. Do you, doesn't that bother you? Well, I'm not going to let myself be bothered by it. I was as surprised as anyone. I didn't know anything like that was, was uh, going on or, or how it came about. There, uh, Traditionally, I don't know whether, I've never looked it up to see whether there was any uh, politically appointed ambassador before that ever participated in the campaign or not. We know that traditionally the Secretary of State doesn't and the Secretary of Defense and uh, the Attorney General, uh, other cabinet members have always been accepted as legitimate campaigners. But uh, no, I was surprised and, uh, uh, and as I say, I don't know <laughs> how it came about. but. Uh, there is no, uh, no restriction actually or anything legally uh, that binds them from doing such a thing. Well, I think the thing that I, I guess I'm getting at, the question that Mary Ann Dolan was raising about Central America and so Senator Helms... Bob, excuse me, no follow-ups. Oh, right. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mr. President, I believe you have time for one more. Oh. How many more were I going to have? Yeah, I'll pass. Uh, yeah. I, I have a chance. All right, as, uh, if, if we're going to do uh, one final, Mr. President, we've uh, all been judging you and your opponent as to how the <coughs> campaign has gone. Why don't you take a minute and judge us? What issues, if any, have not been articulated clearly to the American public uh, during this campaign? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you one. I said it in the debate the other night. I never said, and I never ever thought, and I would have thought anybody was crazy who did think that you could turn a nuclear missile around and call it back. I was talking about the submarines and the airplanes. And the funny thing is, since my opponent rushed forth with a quote from the press conference where that subject was discussed, I have had more people, and I've seen more letters to the editor in papers on campaigning around the country that are saying, well, it's perfectly apparent seeing that, that he was talking about the submarines and the airplanes, not the nuclear missiles. And the thing I've also wondered, and maybe you want to ask some of your 
people about this, that took place at a press conference, the whole discussion and so forth. And what I was talking about as to why we wanted to begin the start talks on the ground-based missiles first. If anyone there had thought that I was talking about turning missiles around, why wasn't there a question? Why didn't they say, do you mean that you mm -hmm. think you can recall mm -hmm. the missiles? No, several days later, yeah. one fellow wrote a column and said, I was so stupid that I believed that you could turn nuclear missiles around. And then it caught on, and I've heard them casually mention it on the air in talk shows over the weekend, uh, members of the press saying the same thing. And of course, Mr. Mondale picked it up and full was off in full cry. But uh, that is one, and how, if it hadn't been for the debate, I would, didn't want to go out there and appear to, that he could tempt me into replying to his charges, so I kept waiting for some of, of Vietnam. That, that yeah, back will come the stories that are, that are leaning the other way. Someone goes down there, something happens. And it, it struck me so forcibly as when I sat around this table with a bunch of congressmen, senators who'd gone down there in one of those bipartisan groups that the legislature sat down. And some of them were die-hard opponents of mine before they went. Didn't want us to give a dime to El Salvador, anything else. And to sit here and hear them as instant converts after what they'd seen tell me that they now believed, yes, El Salvador was trying to have a democracy. And some of them had, had gone by Nicaragua and visited Nicaragua and the change. Believe it or not, one of them uh, sat here at this table and told me that an official of the Nicaraguan government told him rather arrogantly that uh, in about 18 months, uh, maybe they'd better be watching the uh, Mexican-Arizona border because they'd be there. Uh, <laughs> that they were, their revolution was not limited to Nicaragua. But uh, they all turned around. But yes, I think there has been a reluctance to, uh, to fairly uh, evaluate what's going on. People don't there. want to accept it, you know. They do link it up with Vietnam a lot. Yes. Yeah. And we could it, all do a better job, is what I'm thinking. Yes. Everything at your disposal uh, and ours. The, the atrocities, uh, that, let me ask you something. Isn't it true that the minute there's a death squad murder, that, the, that whatever those right wing kooks are, and they kill somebody, wham, that's news. Mm -hmm. But what about the letter I got from a, from a young man who told me about his mother and father in El Salvador, and uh, how the guerrillas came into the village and they brought the mother and father and the children out into the village. This young man had left his family and gotten away. And uh, the villagers told him this story. Now, I can't, I have no way to corroborate this. This was his letter. He said they brought them out there in the village square and they gathered the people around. And then they started in with the machetes and the fingers and the toes and of the children in front of the mother and father, and then killed them, and then went to work on the parents and killed them. Well, it seems to me that if those things are going on, they ought to be some pretty big front page stories. I will say this in your behalf. I, uh, I think there's another electronic element of the media that uh, is uh, more guilty than, so. the, more <laughs> than, than your part of the media is in that. Well, we do too, we do that too. Yeah. So I guess we have to accept part of, <laughs> well, part of that blame. Well, <laughs> well, but I'm thinking of a TV show of someone who got in with camera and all up in one of the uh, guerrilla camps, and it looked like a Sunday school picnic. And there they were with all of the beautiful foliage around and the yeah. children romping in the grass and the and you. They were sitting, having a reading session and so forth, probably reading Karl Marx, but they were reading. And uh, no word about the fact that they were the same ones that were going to go down and blow a bus off the highway and without any idea of who was in that bus. You know. Mr. President, I we know. need to I conclude this. You, you won't be in trouble, but I will if I don't say thank you, Mr. I, President. I'm sorry. You asked some questions I took too long to answer. Not at all. Ask Department of Defense.
Thank you very much.